We are very privileged again tonight to have Dr. Ariel Roth. Um, Dr. Roth, you've spoken to us three, at least three times in the past, over the last 10 years. You know, we've been doing this for almost 11 years. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Well, I love it. Okay, a little about our speaker. Dr. Roth is a former director of the Geo, Geoscience Research Institute in Loma Linda, California. He holds a BA in biology from Pacific Union College and an MS in biology and a PhD in biology from the University of Michigan. His research has been supported by US government agencies. During his career, he held numerous university positions, including professor of biology and chairman, Loma Linda University. During the latter appointment, Dr. Roth, Roth uh, directed a university team for underwater research on coral, which was sponsored by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, called NOAA, by the way. He has authored over 140 articles on origins issues, and for 23 years, he edited the journal, Origins. Um, I will also mention that his training includes beyond biology. He's, he's had uh, a good deal of geology and has shared some really important things with us in the past about uh, unconformities and such in geology. Please welcome Dr. Ariel Roth. Well, it's a real joy to be with you again. I very much enjoy this group here, and uh, I wish I could come down more often. There are so many important issues that are being discussed in this question of uh, creation and evolution. I'm going to touch on just one of them this evening, but one that I happen to be especially interested in. I might state that uh, it is because of this issue that I got into this coral reef question because it's used so often as an argument against the Bible. And when I was uh, teaching at Loma Linda University, I had a number of graduate students. We did research various places over the world on this particular issue. And I thought I would discuss this issue to explain to you what the issue is. It is a major issue uh, among those who try and criticize creation. And it is one that uh, we don't have completely good answers, but as you'll see, it is an issue that requires a certain amount of sophistication uh, to discuss. Well, uh, it's a time issue. Uh, let's uh, just get a few introductory pictures here about coral reefs. Uh, uh, this is a picture of uh, Anahuitoc Atoll. It is the l icon for this argument. It's a huge atoll. It's 20 miles in diameter. It's almost a mile deep. Uh, and uh, of course the question is how long would it take uh, to build this? Now this, this atoll uh, is among the most beautiful places I know of in the world. And I have been there uh, three, four times actually for trip, well, one actually 10 weeks. Uh, doing research there with my graduate students. And uh, because of this issue, this is why we have uh, delved into this. And I can assure you that whenever I came back, I was always teased about spending my time on these beautiful tropical beaches. And uh, the vice president of the university where I was uh, teaching uh, insisted on uh, reminding me about this. Uh, and I uh, insisted on pointing out to him 
the following few pictures here which tell you it's not all just sitting on the beaches enjoying the scenery. Uh, the, the, there are, when you look at these reefs, uh, so many marvelous things there. Uh, There's such rich ecological systems and so on. And the, the fish are perhaps the, the number one uh, exciting issue. And uh, I was working at the uh, annual Weetog Marine Laboratory, and uh, I was using some radioactive calcium. And because of the regulations for using all this, the inspector from the University of Hawaii had to come and check and make sure I wasn't contaminating the countryside, although they had uh, set off at least about 70 atomic bombs before they were around the environment there. Uh, nevertheless, you know, regulations are regulations. But, and he came there, and of course, there's only one plane a week. At that time, there's only one plane a week there. And, and so he had time to uh, look at other things besides our work. And uh, he uh, came to me and he said, uh, are you a creationist? I said, yes. I don't know what, how he could tell because he, he says, you know, I've been out here looking at these fish and so on. He says, I'm just absolutely, there's got to be a creator for all these, this variety that you see here. And you, you can see a little bit of it right here in the, this, this uh, beetle fish here. And uh, here's another one. And uh, uh, this one happens to be in the Bahamas. The previous one is at Anahuitoc. And uh, this one's in Hawaii. It's not a fish. It's a coral. Tells you a little bit about these coral are the things that are supposed to build these reefs. Uh, this is Tubastri, a very interesting coral. It uh, closes up at night. I took this picture very early in the morning uh, before it had closed up. But that's an example of the organisms that, that build these, these uh, huge structures. Um, there's some more coral here and then some more fish uh, at Anuitak Atoll. And then, then sometimes you see uh, some fish that you don't like to see. Uh, sharks, this is a gray shark. Uh, they tend to be aggressive. Most sharks don't bother you. You don't worry about them. But these you kind of keep your eye on uh, when they're around. And uh, one incident that uh, made me grateful to God that I can be with you today uh, was related to some of the research we were doing there. Uh, a group of us there uh, had blasted a hole in the base of the reef, uh, in the lagoon of the reef. Uh, we did this because we wanted to uh, get some samples from there and see what would happen to them uh, after a while. And so uh, this is looking 50 feet down from the surface at this area we blasted. All you can see is a white area and so on. That's, that's where we blasted. Now, when you blast, you kill a lot of fish. When you kill a lot of fish, you attract sharks. And so uh, we decided, oh boy, we're going to stay away from this. Sir. After about three days, our curiosity got the best of us. And we said, hey, let's go see how that thing is doing. And so uh, uh, Dr. Johannes and I at the University of Georgia and two others uh, got in a boat and went out looking at this area. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it looked OK. Uh, we didn't see any shark right at first. And so it was, uh, Dr. Johannes and I had started heading down to look down at the area that had been blasted more closely. And all of a sudden, uh, five sharks came up at us. And uh, very fortunately, the lead shark headed for Dr. Johannes, not for me. Uh, uh, I say this uh, uh, because he, he had a, a shark billy. It's a big pipe with nails on the end pointed nails on the end and that shark headed right for that thing and he smashed his nose into it and he backed off. Uh, but we had these five sharks swimming around us. Now the one of the rules that you've uh, heard uh, before incidentally here, here are the, the picture of those sharks. Uh, one of the rules that you, you are told when there are sharks around, don't swim away quickly and so on. They, they'll just go for you. Just, you know, act nonchalant. 
And so, uh, you know, we're about 20 feet away from the boat. And we, uh, Dr. Johannes yelled to the boat for help. And uh, we started swimming towards the boat gently. And we, when we were about five feet away from the boat, uh, we hadn't talked to each other at all. And we were just concerned about the sharks going around us back and forth. Uh, I just made a lunch for the boat, and at the same time, Dr. John did exactly, we both had the same idea, hey, who cares about this lunch story? We're going to get in that boat just as quickly as possible, and we did. And I'm very, very grateful to God that I can be with you tonight. Uh, so that, that's uh, part of the story. I did not spend so much of my life just sitting on beaches. Uh, there are the other side to it, but no, we, we used to work so hard, you know, a, a, really bothered us that, that we'd be teased so much about this. Well, uh, when we got in the boat, we looked down and, hey, we saw all kinds of sharks we hadn't seen before. We were kind of 21 sharks uh, feeding on those dead fish from, from, the, from the blast type of thing. Well, we went somewhere else where we had blasted. We figured all the sharks were here and we were right. We never saw a single shark at the other place. Uh, but, um, anyway, let's get to this question of, of the briefs. It's a time question, basically. Uh, and you got the, the biblical model of origins, which says that God created, and he created recently, a few thousand years, so we don't have an exact figure on this. Uh, and uh, he did it in six days. Well, uh, major schools of thought disagree with this completely. For instance, we have secular science said, well, no God. It's going to take millions, billions of years. And uh, folks, uh, this idea of billions of years is falling apart scientifically, uh, most recently because of a lot of genetic information that tells you, hey, that, so, you know, you just don't have enough time. Billions of years are totally inadequate, folks for these evolutionary changes that are postulated because the chances are so low. So, uh, but when you come to Anuitak Atoll and so on, it's the scientific interpretation, uh, the geologists who have been there and so on, interpret it in terms of long ages and they suggest various ideas associated with that. Uh, theistic evolution, the idea that God created over very long periods of time is an issue here in terms of the Bible, but uh, theistic evolution, they don't care how long it took any white talk um, to, to grow because, well, we've got billions of years for God to do his evolutionary, uh, or at least help evolution, actually, to, to be uh, more precise, theistic evolution. God uses the process of evolution so on, but he does it over billions of years. And then you've got the progressive creation. Again, God does this process of creating more advanced forms of life over a long time. Why God would take so long uh, to do this when he's involved in the thing and creates so complex things is not explained, but it's, it's a way of a kind of accommodating the long geologic ages and issues like Anna we talk with uh, some ID that, well, sure, a lot of time. Now, God doesn't require time. But uh, in order to kind of compromise between the biblical story and the scientific interpretations of long ages, uh, a lot of Christians believe in progressive creation. And when you have that, you immediately run into some serious problems. For instance, did God create life on earth recently, as indicated in the Bible? It's not just a question of Genesis. You know, in the Ten Commandments, God says, keep my Sabbath holy because I did it all in six days. Is God a liar? The integrity of God, the integrity of the Bible, 
in, in our confidence in the Bible is very much challenged by these quarries. If you think they took so long, uh, wonder is the Bible reliable and so on, uh, reefs can, can affect uh, your rural view. So this is the issue. Is the Bible reliable? Is it true? Is it God's word? Or are scientific interpretations, uh, whether it be progressive creation or evolu uh, theistic evolution, so on, uh, or atheistic uh, science, are those the real story? So that's what we're getting at here in this discussion about coral reefs here. Well, the issue is time. Coral reefs are built slowly by organisms and the often rates of growth are estimated at a few million millimeters per year. And you've got these huge reefs. How could you do that in a few thousand years? Uh, 6,000 years, uh, some interpretations, 7, 8, 10. Well, we say less than 10,000 years. So. Uh, how, uh, how are you going to get these huge structures? Many claim that uh, Coral reefs invalidated the Bible because they say, well, it'll take over 100,000 years to grow, and we talk, and other reefs. There are hundreds of those reefs out there uh, in various forms and so on. And so, you know, we have these huge reefs, and uh, we have fossil reefs. I'm not getting into the fossil reef issue uh, tonight at all. That's a, a different discussion. That was very fascinating one, incidentally. Uh, but uh, we're looking now at the living reefs that we now find, like those that exist right at present. Here's a picture of one of those reefs. This is Wotho Atoll out in the Marshall Islands. Uh, there were, I believe, about 86 people on that in 1970 when I took this picture. There are now 97 people there. Uh, they live out there, you know, it's, it's kind of a... Uh, a uh, simpler way of life, uh, which sometimes we wish we had. Uh, but you see that ring, and uh, that is one of these atolls. That's one of these atolls that is deep. And the question, how long would it take to build that? Uh, you, you, you see the outline right there, uh, as I pointed out here. And here's the issue. These huge reefs sit on top of mounds of volcanic rock. Here you've got the, the mound of volcanic rock, the, the gray portion below, and then you got this uh, buff colored uh, reef on top of it. And so the, the question is, how long does it take to grow these reefs on these volcanic bases? And there are suggestions, you know, uh, a very long time, uh, as we'll mention in just a minute. Here's a, this is a, a close-up view of those reefs, uh, the rings they form. The lagoon in the middle is quite shallow. This is Anahuitoc, incidentally. Uh, this is the deep ocean out there, which is several miles deep. The lagoon's probably only two or three hundred feet. You, you can see from this picture here, this is the lagoon right here. You got those interesting pinnacles there that uh, they boggle your mind because, you know, they're going up over 100 feet from that lagoon. And it, some of them are narrow, as I've shown there, you know, and straight up. They're built by, you know, uh, millions of organisms. How do these organisms organize themselves uh, to build up these things? Uh, they're one of the baffling things that you have about these reefs. There's a number of baffling things about, about these reefs, but those pinnacles are, are very fascinating as they come up from, from the lagoon uh, that is shallow compared to the, the deep ocean uh, on the outside. So the issue is how long is it going to take to build up those structures? And we talk, I thought, this is the rim. These things are a big ring. Uh, 20 miles in diameter for Anahuitoc Atoll, about 40 low islands like this one right here. This is an island. In between the islands, you got a shallow 
reef. It's still built, really, but it's seldom exposed at low tide, but the islands stay dry. Well, in our uh, research, we've had the uh, fortune of having some of the best research facilities in the world available to us. This is the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, operated by the University of Hawaii. This is the Scripps Institution of Oceanography here in La Jolla, California. Operates ships around the world for do research. This is the Alpha Helix ship. And I was uh, with that ship there uh, for about 10 weeks. This is at Anawetak Atoll. It's very nice to have those things there because you've got all kinds of equipment. Here's a instrument to count radioactivity. And that's very nice if you're using radioactive calcium to try and measure a growth rate of, of corals and so on. And a million and a half dollars worth of equipment on that ship is very nice to have there. And so we were fortunate to get on that ex expedition. Uh, one of my most interesting weeks in my life was living in the ocean for one week uh, in the Bahamas. Uh, I got a telephone call from uh, Morgan Wells uh, of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Wondered if I would come and use their underwater laboratory. I told him no. And then uh, he called me up a week later. I don't know why. <laughs> he said, have you changed your mind? I told him maybe. Uh, and uh, I told him now, you know, uh, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, we will not use that facility on Sabbath uh, because we, we consider the Sabbath God's rest day and consider it quite, quite sacred. Uh, he said, yeah, 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 we, we know that. I had worked with him uh, and we talked years before and so on. We, we knew each other. And so on. He said, sir, we, we know that. No, you, you go and use that for a week, but uh, on Saturday you can rest. So, you know, uh, why not? Uh, well, uh, it's interesting, life in the ocean, it's 50 feet down, uh, pressure is 22 pounds per square inch above atmospheric pressure. This is the facility. It's about 9 feet in diameter, 18 feet long, and uh, you can live here, and you go out, and you can go work in the coral zone. The one thing you can't do is go up, uh, because you go up, uh, you you get the divers disease events and so on. They, you, you avoid that. Should there be a fire in there, we had this escape facility here where we get out and stand here and we, there was some air there and we could breathe uh, while the fire burned in, in, the, in the habitat. It's just a, a means of, because you cannot go up. The one thing you really fear is uh, getting lost. After a storm there uh, one night, uh, this is what, uh, facility looks like and you can't see it very well. You swim out very far beyond that and you can't see anything. You get lost. You have no choice but to go up. And uh, all kinds of uh, things can happen because bubbles form in your blood and they uh, get to your brain and that's not helpful. Uh, so uh, we tie a rope to this and a uh, 200 foot rope and uh, go as far as we could and want to make sure it didn't get untied. Uh, come back, follow it back, uh, so we carry on our work. To get in and out of that facility, uh, they put the door on the bottom. You can understand why they put the door on the bottom. If they put it on top, all the air would go out and the water would fill it. Uh, but the door's on the bottom. Uh, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's this little darker thing that you see right there. That's the door, and then the hole there is uh, which that door would close. We kept it open all, all the time, except for, for our final exit from there. It's exhausting. The work is exhausting. The diving is demanding on your uh, uh, physical abilities and so on. But uh, we, had, we did some research. I was looking on the concentration of pigments because I was working on light. And, uh, other uh, graduates since they're doing temperature experiments and so on. Three of us were in there. Uh, that was the normal complement. Uh, here are a couple of the graduate students I had with me uh, collecting coral. Uh, 
got a lot of work done there, incidentally. Uh, some people work better under pressure, and we certainly had those conditions. This is the inside. Water boils at 256 degrees Fahrenheit there because of the pressure. I had air conditioning, so that we never used it. The temperature was just fine that way, and so on. Uh, most facility, normal facilities, you want, uh, except space. Three of us slept there, and so on. That was the, the normal complement for for that facility. Incidentally, uh, one couple decided to get married in that thing. I uh, took a can of nuts down to eat, and this is what the pressure did to it. Uh, started changing the nuts into peanut butter. And you can tell from the radius of curvature of the cranium there who that is. Sabbath, I taught Sabbath school lesson. We discussed things. Uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm the first underwater Sabbath school teacher or not, but uh, uh, I could try that one for Guinness's Book of World Records. The uh, one question came up while we were discussing the lesson was, hey, uh, what would, what if Jesus returned while we were there? Would we know about it? And then uh, also another question was, well, uh, if we were to go up, assuming we were going to go up, uh, would we have to decompress? Because it takes, <laughs> almost a whole night to decompress to get out of that once you're saturated down there. Well, uh, fortunately, uh, Christ did not return while we were there, and so he uh, uh, didn't have any complications in respect to that. But it's, it's an interesting and different way of, uh, of thinking when you get down there. There was a, a grouper. Well, it was about four feet long lived around the uh, habitat. This is him. I'm looking down through the door. He just happened to <laughs> swim under there for us one day, you know. And uh, man, I, I saw a food chain better probably than most people have seen. Uh, looking out the window one evening. Uh, uh, this is this is the, uh, the habitat, you know. And uh, there was a light right here. And the grouper, we called him Fang. Uh, he used to park up here. And uh, when the fish would come out here in the light, he would all of a sudden dive for them, grab them, you know. Well, one day, I was just looking there, and I saw a little bit of lemony, you know, about three or four inches long. And a snapper came by and just grabbed him. The snapper was about a foot long. Just grabbed that bolemony. Within five seconds, Fang was up there and grabbed the snapper. Well, anyway, that's 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 the food chain there, the, the, the illustrated there. Uh, to get out of the facility, you uh, decompress. You, the pressure is lowered. Close the door. Uh, you decompress for all night almost. Like you you got to get rid of all that nitrogen that's in your tissues. And so you breathe, the uh, last few hours you breathe straight oxygen and you uh, keep moving around to make sure you get all that gas out of your tissues. And, and then you get inside this thing, which we call the trunk. And uh, you close that door up there and you close, the, the bottom door is closed. Otherwise the water will all come in because you're under low pressure you know, when you do that after, after decompressing all night. And uh, then you turn on a, a tank of air to get the pressure back up. But, you know, since you do it fast, your tissues don't saturate. And as soon as your pressure gets high enough so that that door opens up, you can go out and go back up. And uh, you don't have to decompress. So that, that's how you get out of there uh, and don't have to... Uh, uh, risk so much of getting uh, the diver's disease, the, the bends. Anyway, that, that facility was taken to the Smithsonian Institution, and uh, you can see there, uh, they cleaned it up a little bit. Here, here's the inside. Uh, 
that's the uh, trunk I was telling you about where you decompress and so on. And it, uh, uh, it's since been moved to the uh, National Oceanic Administration, Administration Headquarters in Maryland. Well, let's get back to this issue of uh, how long would it take to grow Anahuita? Uh, two ways of pronouncing Anahuita uh, and spelling it. Anahuita is the uh, traditional name, uh, but uh, I think the Marshallese prefer Anahuita at all. Well, you're going to have to grow up this great thickness here. And it's, you know, uh, quite thick. On the northeast corner, the, the, they drilled down and they went through limestone, lime material, down to 4,610 feet. Uh, on, on this end here, uh, they drilled down and they ran into uh, through limestone for 4,158 feet. So it, how are you going to grow 4,000 feet of coral uh, in a few thousand years? And this, you can understand why this is a favorite issue among some who uh, feel that the uh, creation account is not correct. Well, Alan Hayward, uh, for instance, states in uh, his book, Evolution, the Facts and the Fiction, that uh, and it would grow it would, that 4,600 feet deep in 10,000 years would require a growth rate of 5.5 inches or 140 millimeters per year. That's what it would take. Now, he states such rates have been shown to be quite impossible. Several other estimates uh, suggest hundreds of thousands of years as a minimum. And the geologic Literature suggests the base of the atoll is probably easing. The data is not very sharp. It's not very good. But the, the suggestion is there. The Eocene, and uh, that's in the 40 million year range for the lowest part. So you, you can see the, uh, the issue. Uh, they tried some radiometric dating. It did not turn out all that good. Uh, they, they did get an increase in dates as they went down, but... Uh, they didn't uh, agree very well, and they got some reversals. This is uh, various samples here. They tried the ionum uranium dates near the surface 6,300 years, a little lower down, 8,400, uh, 132,000, and then a little lower down, 12,000. And they had reversals in, in this issue. And, and, so, and then they tried carbon-14 dating, and uh, they got 2,700. Uh, these are comparable statements, uh, samples. 3,800, you got 23,000 fires for that one, 4,900. Some of my colleagues out there in any dog doing research with me uh, decided to carbon 14 date uh, some of the samples there. And a year later, I checked with them and I asked them uh, how those how those carbon 14 dates go. And said, well, uh, the one that was lower down was younger than the one that was higher up. Uh, it says, we wonder if we didn't confuse the two statements, uh, the two samples. Well, uh, this, anyway, that this, uh, radio dating is not the easiest question uh, for, for um, creatures to answer and so on, but there, there is no shortage of problems. Uh, they do get a little bit of consistency, as you can see from the in general increase as you go down, per se. Well. Here's Anahuitoc Atoll from a plane. Right here to the left, lower down here and so on, is uh, Anahuitoc Island. And uh, a graduate student and I, we decided, hey, we want to go up to this island up here. And uh, this island here is about a mile long. You can walk along here at low tide. You can't do it at high tide. But you can walk along here at low tide. So we, we ran up there at low tide and took some pictures and so on, came back, and almost did not make it back because the tide was really getting up high. When we, anyway, on this island, they, they've assembled, you know, dozens of atomic bombs. They did a lot of tests of atomic bombs there and the equipment's there and so on. But it's also on that island that they drilled the most important drill hole, the one that's been most studied, to go down and find out what's what's below. 
And here's a picture of uh, where that drill hole was. Uh, just happened to find it uh, off limits on uh, in there. And uh, here's the inside. And here's the, what the remains of that well where they went down. This one, 4,158 feet before they ran into basalt rock. It was limestone rock and so on. The uh, results that they've gotten for reef growth are highly varied. Uh, this table is extremely important uh, for you to understand what is uh, involved here in the coral reef growth. This is material I've taken from the literature that tells you estimates of rates of reef growth in the literature. And we have here maximum growth rate of coral reef frame builders. So I did this question, how long is it going to take to grow this reef? And so using various methods, carbon-14, that would not be very good. Carbon-14 is not good in limestone because it's, limestone is so easily replaced. It's not very reliable and so on. But anyway, rates suggested in the literature is given here in millimeters per year, 5 to 15 and so on. And I uh, put here minimum years to grow a 1,400 meter reef, which is what Anna we talk. Uh, so uh, at that rate, it'd take you 233,000 uh, years to do it. Uh, another estimate here is uh, 9 tenths of a millimeter to 74 millimeters, and that would be a million to 18,000. Another one here is one to uh, less than 20 millimeters per year, and so on that basis, it would take you 1,400,000 to 70,000 years. Then 80 millimeters here, uh, suggested by Odom, a very famous um, scientist who studied and we talk. And at that rate, you'd take 17,500 years. Now, that's getting kind of interesting because, you know, this is in the ballpark of the Bible uh, figures and so on. But then the soundings, where they, they go down and measure the depth, and years later they come back and measure the same reef, its depth, 280 millimeters per year. And at that rate, it would only take over about 5,000 years to build Anahuitoc. So what's the problem? Soundings are probably the simplest and most direct measurement you can make. And those give you the shortest figures. Well, we can go on here. Uh, Smith and Kinsey, the CO2 system, they estimate two to five millimeters, and that would be 700,000 to so on. A CO2 system again here, uh, 0.8 to 1.1 millimeters, and they got the, the million year range, and then uh, another study of soundings, region of Indonesia and so on, uh, 414 millimeters per year that they measured for that growth rate, they were measuring at two different times after uh, allowing for growth in between, and that would take only 3,380 years. So y you can find in the literature those figures that tell you, hey, uh, these things can grow quite fast. Uh, it's there, uh, but it's not what is usually referred to when people want to challenge the Bible. Well, a as far as uh, growth rate of, of corals themselves, then right, millimeters per year, var various row here, 543 and 120, 100, 226, 6,000 years and so on for uh, Acropora cervicornis, 3,200 years. So the potential is there, folks. It's in the literature. But those who want to criticize the Bible don't refer to the short figures here. They use the longer figures. So keep in mind uh, that, uh, that these various dates that we have here, another thing you have to be convinced with is how extremely variable these things are. I mean, uh, you, you got to say, hey, we really don't know what we're doing uh, when you have such variable dates as that. Uh, and there's no question about that. Why should estimates vary so much like this? Well, so, some uh, other uh, suggestions of how fast they grow. This one uh, textbook in Verbal Zoology says can, colonies can grow vertically as much as 10 centimeters per year. Well, you know, this puts it in the uh, uh, 
a few thousand year category. If you if you sign ten centimeters per year, and you you find that occasionally. Uh, here's another reference here in National Geographic. Thirty thirty one years. They, they, these were ships that had been sunk down during World War II. They came 31 years later. Look at them. And they did find uh, hard coral, stone corals, they call them, uh, growing, you know, at least an inch a year, uh, two inches in diameter, uh, sideways, and so on. Another one, 15 feet high in 31 years, that'd be half a foot a year, and so on. Uh, this brings them down into the, uh, into the possibility is there. Well, let me tell you about a uh, recent publication on the internet. This is by the American Scientific Affiliation. Now, this is a Christian organization, but they do not agree with a recent creation. And at times they do uh, criticize recent creation. And they were, there had been talk, one of the talks, you know, was about coral race. Hey, uh, what are you going to do about all these cars that take so long to go? And uh, here is the conclusions uh, of that. This is on the uh, internet, the web page. This is the last paragraph of the report. Now, note this carefully. Remember, they're concluding that reefs can't go fast enough, that the biblical account of creation cannot be correct as it's interpreted when read directly. Remember, if we multiply the fastest observed reef growth rates by a factor of 10, so we say, oh, hey, even multiply those by 10, and assume continuous maximum growth rate, and assume no erosion breaks. There are some erosion breaks in the Hanawit Dog. I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Or storm damage. I'm not sure that's all that important. Uh, You'd expect storms, regardless of rates of growth, and assume that subsidence was somehow greatly accelerated. They're saying, hey, uh, the ocean floor did not sink down fast enough to grow these reefs. They're getting outside of the reef argument in this. They're saying uh, the ocean floor is supposed to sink down at a certain rate. And if you're going to grow uh, and we talk at uh, in a few thousand years, you're going to have to sink that floor down faster, which as is getting out of the uh, argument and uh, into another. Uh, when the Bible talks about a worldwide flood, worldwide catastrophe, and so on, uh, that kind of argument doesn't hold very good. But they inserted it here. Subsidence was somehow greatly accelerated. We would still need 14,000 years for the growth of and we talk. This is, of course, uh, 10 times what they're, they, they found some figure where they got 140,000 uh, for it uh, and so on. And they're trying, well, you know, you're not going to do it in 10,000 or 6,000 years if it takes 14,000. Well, uh, this is getting pretty close. I mean, considering how variable these figures are, it's hard to make much of a, a case out of this. But let me uh, refer to some of those statements in that concluding paragraph here and t tell you why uh, you need to question what you see on the internet regarding living reefs. For instance, they say, multiply facet observed growth rates by a factor of 10. Well, you remember those rates I showed you on the table? To use those rates, you know, it wouldn't take 14,000 years. It would take only 338 years. If you're going to play this game of, hey, multiply 10 times, you ought to know your literature. No erosion breaks. There are three major erosion breaks in Anno We Talk. Uh, some of them have been found on Bikini. Two main ones uh, have been found on Bikini uh, that they think they can correlate and so on, where, where they think the reef was exposed. And they say, well, if it was exposed above sea level, you would not have uh, any growth, which is true, of course. But uh, this, the geology doesn't fit that very well because uh, these erosion breaks could be caused by lenses of fresh water. 
and you have these in many of these coral islands and limestone islands where rainwater that floats on seawater is above the other water and would cause some of the changes that the geologists say, uh, hey, uh, this was above sea level and um, it need not be there at all. We all know what fresh water does to limestone. You've heard about these uh, collapses, uh, houses falling down, so on, where you have lime and so on. Uh, this is what's going to happen, and this is what you have in these lenses of water. They call, call them Guyben Herzberg lenses, if you want a fancy name for them. And they're there. So these breaks could be produced very rapidly by a string of storms that piles up the water in there. It dissolves and it gives the appearance of a break. Storm damage. Some storms build up reefs. For instance, in 1972, Cyclone Bebe on Funafuti Island, the storm surge of that cyclone, it's like a hurricane, tornado, this type of thing. They use the term cyclone out there in the Pacific for that. Caused a, a, a rampart to be built. The waves took the material from lower down around the outside of the reef and built up the, this rampart. Uh, it was 3.5 meters high, 35 meters wide, and ran for 18 kilometers. I've talked to Jim Marigos, who wrote the paper there on that, published in Science. Uh, he told me, he said, look, I think that, that whole rampart there was probably built in about two or three minutes from the, the major storm surge. And the other stuff was not important in the thing. Uh, storms, uh, that can work both ways. Storms can wash up down too. You know. But uh, to, to make a special point of that, didn't, then and say, and assume that the subsidence was somewhat greatly accelerated. Uh, you'd expect this from the biblical model. You're not challenging the biblical model. If you're challenging the biblical model, don't use something that's so implicit almost in the biblical model that you have some rapid changes during a worldwide flood. Anyway, this tells you a little bit of what they're talking about. These breaks, there are three of them around here. And then we talk, at least they, they think there were three, uh, one below the other. But uh, you have lenses of fresh water because when it rains, that water from the rain goes, fills up, produces these lenses of fresh water. They would cause these, these features that they think are important in the breaks. So you, you have that issue. Now, a very interesting issue comes up here when you're discussing coral reefs and uh, these reefs out in the Pacific. And this diagram tells you a little bit about what we're talking about, and that's a little bit what they're referring to in that paper when they say, hey, you got to have more rapid subsidence type of thing. Uh, and here's, here's the, the fascinating issue that is involved here. Coral require light because they have an algae, a symbiotic algae, and that symbiotic algae provides nutrients to the coral. To have rapid coral growth, you have to have light. It's uh, two organisms working together. So without light, you cannot have coral growth. Now, in the Pacific Ocean, Northern Pacific Ocean, so on, you've got a lot of these mounds, various kinds of mounds, of, and uh, <clears throat> Things, some have coral on them, some don't. This is a picture of the ocean. This is just a diagram, you understand. Uh, this is the ocean. You can see uh, here in the, very soon you get in the ocean, it gets dark. And you don't have light, and so you could not have coral growing deep down. So if you're going to have coral, you must have assumed that this was up at the surface, or the coral down here would not have grown. Now, fascinating. Uh, Thing that you see when you look at some of these uh, mounds of, um, this is all volcanic rock, you understand? The yellow is coral material. Is that, uh, for instance, this is Bikini Atoll. You may have heard of Bikini Atoll. We did a lot of Tongban tests there also, uh, uh, besides any we talk. And, uh, right next to Bikini Atoll is uh, Sylvania Gio. It has a flat top. 
about the same level as Bikini Atoll. No coral reef on it. Why? This is an enigma. We don't have a good answer for that, but really puzzling. You can postulate a number of answers for it. But you can look at some others here, and you look like Horizon Gill, which is uh, closer to Hawaii, between Anahuitaga and Hawaii. It's uh, on the other side of Johnston Island, if you happen to be familiar with that and so on. But anyway, on Horizon Gill, you find a number of limestone sediments, and they think they grew there. And they think maybe that it was even above the surface, but they're about a mile down where it's dark. You've got Darwin gill. Uh, these uh, mounds that have a flat top, they call them guillot, French. It's named after a Swiss geologist. They've got a ring around the outside, and they think, hey, it formed a ring just like these uh, other uh, reefs we showed you. Uh, these major reefs that we showed you. These are an enigma, of course, and they have raised a, a question. It's not just those people like those in the American Scientific Affiliation who want to criticize creation who are puzzled by this, but the geological literature is also puzzled by it uh, because uh, how are you going to drown a reef when the reef can grow so fast. Here's a quotation from a geologist, Geologist Society of America Bulletin, 1981, Schlager. He says, the growth potential of 1,000 micrometers per year, that's one millimeter, convert that figure for you, exceeds any relative rise in sea level caused by long-term process and chart record. He's, he's taking a very slow rate of one millimeter per year, you know. We, we talked about uh, 400 uh, in some cases. Uh, but he takes that, that, that very slow rate. Newly formed ocean crust subsided at a maximum rate of one quarter of a millimeter per year, 250 micrometers per year. Basin subsided averages 10 to 10 micrometers per year. And sea level rises due to increased seafloor spreading and amount to be less than 10 micrometers, which would be about a tenth of a millimeter. So, uh, less than that, sorry. See, this is one millimeter, it'd be uh, one hundredth of a millimeter. Anyway, so he says, hey, all this stuff's going very slow here. How did these reefs get drowned? Well, maybe things happened faster in the past, folks. Uh, this is, and the issue here is, hey, uh, even if you say the reefs grew only one millimeter per year, subsidence is much slower. And so how in the world did, do we have any drowned reefs? And it's, you know, it's a suggestion that, hey, uh, things can go a lot faster than we normally think about in terms of standard geological interpretations. Of course, this tends to fit a little bit with the catastrophic model of the Bible. Well, uh, another factor that is not considered, I don't know why, they say, well, uh, so, so uh, some coral growth quite fast, uh, but uh, when they break and so on, uh, you're not going to have that much there, per se. But these coral multiply. And uh, Shin makes an interesting analogy here about these corals, especially those that are elongated, long ones, and so on, like we showed you in one of the pictures earlier. He, he, said, he calculates that 10 branches, each growing at the rate of 100 millimeters per year, uh, that's in the 10 centimeter range he's using here. This is standard scientific literature, uh, general environmental geology, and subdividing into three branches each year. So he starts with 10 branches. He subdivides them three times a year. In 10 years, he's going to have 59 kilometers of branches. The potential for producing a lot of lime material is there, folks. That is very much there. So that uh, uh, keep in mind uh, the argument you can't get enough stuff. Uh, Growth here can be in more in the exponential uh, 
uh, geometric growth, uh, whatever term you like to use for that, uh, continued to linear growth, which we've been talking about. And here, here's a stand of coral here, and you can see the branching. So on, just to illustrate what we're talking about here, that you can produce a lot of material uh, if it has the right conditions under which to grow. This is the fastest growing coral there is. Estimated probably grow about 264 millimeters per year. A crop, a uh, cervicornis. I haven't taken this picture in, in Florida of this thing, but uh, these things keep branching. They can keep producing quite a bit of material for, for these huge reefs. Uh, th these uh, stone corals, and this thing's about three feet in diameter. Th these stone corals uh, grow more slowly. They're more, of course, they're, they're, they're more solid and so on, but keep in mind, uh, not all coral grow that fast. Now, just thought I'd take just a few minutes to tell you a little bit about some experiments we had done with my, had done with my graduate students simply to uh, make a, pr a point to you about scientific research. How fast do these grow? Well, we, we would collect coral, collect them and test them to see how fast they grow. Well. Uh, how do you tell how fast they grow? Well, you can go, of course, and measure them, and then come back a year later and measure some more and so on, but it's kind of a slow process. So what we did instead is to collect the tips and put them under in the presence of radioactive calcium. I'll use the calcium-45, which has a half-life of about a half a year, and uh, see how much it absorbed of that. Here's the tip of a coral. Uh, the greenish stuff is the zooxanthellae, the algae that grows with it, has to have light. These are the organisms of cells. They live in colonies. They grab food and they also absorb food from the ocean water to build the, these skeletons. We collect a whole bunch of them, for instance, because the uh, biological variability is very serious here. And so you put them in the laboratory put them in the presence of radioactive calcium. We can tell, we can detect growth in 15 seconds with this radioactive material. I mean, we don't have to sit there for a year. We usually do 20 minutes. One set of experiments we were doing once came back the next morning. A bunch of our samples we left in open test tubes were missing. What happened? Well, this tells you we caught the ants right in the act. These two ants here taking these radioactive samples, I guess, to their nest, which may be not the ideal place uh, for them. We, we didn't know where the nest was and, and so on, but this is some of the problems you run into uh, running experiments in the tropics. Uh, but I, I, I marvel that just two ants could pick up that great big hunger, a piece of coral right there. It's not very big, but anyway, it, it, uh, for them it's very big. We wanted to see, are there factors that could speed up the speed of coral growth? Well, carbonate, can uh, sodium carbonate, by adding sodium carbonate, this is the normal rate of growth. You can see we can increase it uh, depending on different light conditions we use here, but all this chart says is that you know, by adding sodium carbonate, you can speed up the rate of coral growth. Now, don't take this as uh, being a solution uh, uh, to uh, making these corals grow very fast all the time. But we don't know the effect of this on uh, what I would uh, We might expect some of this uh, during the flood at least and so on, but uh, effect on long terms and so on. But we were able to find that uh, this does speed it up a little bit. Temperature, I had some of my students several working on temperature. Coral only grow in the tropical regions where the temperatures are high on this world map where you see the red stuff. This is where we have the coral reefs of the world. And so we have to go there to find them and test them out. And by raising the temperature a few degrees centigrade, uh, normal temperature is around 27 degrees centigrade, and uh, you get up to 32 and so on. But you go beyond that. You raise the temperature too much, and it slows it down right back to where it was before. So, but. Uh, th this is part of the picture of uh, trying to see uh, various factors that might affect the rate of light. I studied light myself, and it's a complex thing. Uh, you're looking down here, 50 feet, at a coral growing here in Anahuitac. Uh, it's on the outside, on the ocean side of the, 
of the uh, atoll and so on. Uh, so some uh, table corals growing right here. And you go down about 100 feet, lots of coral still growing there. And you go down to 150 feet, and there's virtually no coral, some, some black coral right here, uh, and so on, virtually no coral. Uh, so, you know, they, they need this light. Well, what kind of light do they need, and uh, how, uh, how effective is it, and so on, were some of the questions we were asking. So we tested out. And we, we used this in Hawaii, used this lagoon right here where the waves would not get us. And she so put the coral down deeper and closer to the surface, so on, different light conditions. This is the equipment we used, 18 million disintegrations per second in the radioactive stuff we were using there. Here's the coral. Keep the temperature constant. Uh, this plastic allows ultraviolet to go through. Keep on various conditions. Uh, in the laboratory, this is an end we talk, uh, we put it in this container that had uh, light, artificial light so we could have constant conditions. Again, in 20 minutes, we could tell how fast the coral was growing. And here are some uh, constant uh, condition Temperatures kept constant, oxygen uh, provided, so on. Uh, and we put the coral in these various containers and see how fast they grow under various light conditions. Uh, Sometimes we use no light at all, because that's why you can't see anything. But light varies a lot. And you see different colors better than you see others. Uh, but this is, so we have to measure, hey, what kind of light are these corals looking at? And so we, the picture gets complicated, as you see. And uh, this is uh, the light spectrum at the surface. This is the total amount of light. And this is uh, 17 meters down, be about 50 feet down. This is how much light there is there. And you go on, uh, uh, some of our, in that container I told you about, some of the light uh, bulbs gave you very bright light, so we were sure we were saturating. This is the noon sun. This is red down here. You see uh, your eye is much more sensitive to the yellows and the greens than it is to the red and the blues. I misspoke to you, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, this is the blue here, the red's over at this end. This is the wavelength of the light, so anyway, this is all part of the picture you do. Uh, this is the pigment of the coral. What does it absorb? Well, coral did the best right here, but the pigment uh, seemed to absorb light uh, in a different pattern. There were other pigments, uh, water solid pigments, that we did not consider in this. Uh, so, but it, anyway, it tells you a little bit about what is involved. But here, here's a, uh, a test of light, natural light in Hawaii. Those cases of, that I showed you, those cases that I, uh, that plastic case I showed you. And interestingly, more light. This is the total light intensity. It grows faster, tends to grow faster, till you get too much light, and they slow down. And this became very interesting because I suspect, hey, maybe ultraviolet light, which is present in sunlight, uh, is inhibiting the growth of these corals. This is just lighter different conditions here uh, in, in the ocean. Uh, for instance, right here, this would be 17 meters down on a cloudy day. You'd have only this much light. Light is dim in the morning. It's highest around noon and so on, uh, just to show you how variable light is. but. Uh, this shows you a test of uh, light, and here you see that the more light you give, the slower they grow. Well, some of these tests of coral may involve at the surface, be at the surface where you have inhibition due to too much light. And this, this is what, what that shows. And then the thing gets more and more complicated, folks. You have two organisms living together here in coral. So we decided to test them before, so we know how, how previous conditions would do. Was there a lag effect? And we discovered a lag effect there. All these were tested for 20 minutes in total darkness. But uh, before that, these were in dark. These were in dim light. These were in bright light. And uh, the dark and the bright did not do as well. There's no difference between the two. 
but the bright light, even though tested in total darkness, grew, grew faster and a statistically significant results, which we're always pleased to see. And here, here's an even more complicated set where you have light or dark test conditions tried during the day when it's been exposed to this before and to try to do it at night when, uh, again, it's been exposed to no light before and test them under light and dark and so on. We got no significant difference between light and dark. It was, it was a change. And it was what we expected. But statistically, these things are so variable. Uh, some tips calcify 20 to 30 times faster than other tips. So we have to do lots of tips and so on. Uh, and the statistics uh, uh, gets challenging. But we found that if you test coral under either light or dark, in the daytime, they grow faster than if you test them either under light or dark at night, which tells you there's some kind of cycle here of uh, the way they, the way they um, calcify, the rate at which they calcify. That previous slide tells you, hey, these coral reefs grow faster uh, bright sunlight than when there's a cloudy day. Uh, because that dim light uh, gives lower results and so on. So, well, getting to the conclusion here on, on this topic, let, let's look at the remarks. Factors that may favor rapid coral growth. One, we know uh, add carbonate ion. We showed you an experiment, showed you. It helps a little. You don't give too much. Increase in carbon dioxide. Yeah, a little, little too much. And this gets into complicated chemistry of uh, seawater and the amount of carbon dioxide. Temperature, well, we almost doubled it, but don't go too high. It'll stop down. And we don't know if that's long term. Catastrophic buildup, that could be important. We told you about, you know, how the storm waves were uh, built up that uh, rampart at Funafuti Atoll. Microbial precipitation of carbonates, heat convection, this has been such a by Whitmore, uh, that uh, maybe microorganisms are producing this limestone that's in these atolls. And uh, this, of course, is a way of producing it quite rapidly. Bedrock produced by, by electrodes in seawater might be a delineated factor. Uh, Jim here has uh, suggested uh, this idea here, and it, uh, it thinks, you know, this, it's a possibility here. Then we have other organisms expect to fill between the framework and branches. Keep that in mind. You don't just have to, I mean, it's not just a question of those tips growing up so fast and so on. You've got a lot of stuff filling in between when you look at this stuff in these reefs, including algae, foraminifera, bryozoans, mollusks. Hundreds of feet of drill holes in Anuitak Atoll had no coral. Keep that in mind. This is not, we don't know that that thing was a solid coral thing at all. I like think they had one, one uh, area, 400 feet, they didn't find a single coral. Another one, 700 feet, didn't find a single coral. But this is, of course, just one drill hole, so you know, the sample is very small. Hundreds of feet of drill hole in that regard had no coral. Plankton blooms can be fast. All of a sudden, you get all kinds of organisms producing uh, precipitating carbonate out of, out, of the, out of the ocean. And trapped sediments. Well, uh, these, these corals, they, they, they'll trap sediments, of course, because the water tends to flow more slowly you know, in all these coral heads, and of course the sediments tend to settle out. And so on. so uh, you've got these, these, these various factors here. And then factors that slow down coral growth. And uh, you need to keep these in mind as you try and evaluate how fast a coral reef grows. Because uh, you've got pollution, and are our reefs healthy now? Well, we don't know. We know a lot of them aren't. Because, you know, my man, these are delicate organisms. And they're easily affected. Ultraviolet light, we mentioned, can affect the surface estimates. Visible light, photo oxidation is a well known phenomenon, can affect 
uh, some of the measurements you do right at the top may not be the fastest. Genetic degeneration over time, this has not been analyzed in coral that I know of, but we know that this is an extremely important thing that is coming forth in many studies lately showing that genetic degeneration is for real, it's serious, and it's going exactly the opposite way that you expect from evolution, where you, you expect you know, genetic advancement. Well, I just thought I'd mention this Romans 8.22, for we know that the whole creation grown up in trouble and pain until now. These reefs could have gone a lot faster before we had all the people, all the pollution we have at present, and before they had degenerated uh, genetically. And here's a, just a picture of uh, some of these table reefs, uh, one growing on top of the other. Table of Cropera, I should say. This is a dying reef. I mean, it is sick. And you can see you know, how unhealthy these look. So in conclusion, living reefs have the potential of growing within a few thousand years. Keep that in mind. That's in the literature. They do not represent a sound argument against the Bible. If you know your literature, don't let people tell you that, hey, uh, this is a real problem. It's true that reefs at present aren't growing all that fast at times and so on, but there are examples where they do grow very fast. Living reefs grow too fast to accommodate the drowned reefs in the context of long geological ages. We talked to you about the, you know, how hey, it's going down to, how are you going to get these drowned reefs? Even the very slow rates of reef, you should not have those drowned reefs. They're there. Things, some things have gone on very much faster than the surmised by normal geological processes. They do not represent a quite impossible challenge to the biblical account of creation, as is some, sometimes suggested. And that's because of the various factors I've told you. But, uh, that's, a, that's an overstatement here. Uh, that you find in, in the literature uh, that, that we mentioned earlier. The study of nature often reveals much more complicated reality than commonly believed. And this I think you need to keep in mind. Whenever you seem to go to nature and look at it, it turns out to be so much more complex than you had planned on at first. You know, you think, oh, hey, go ahead and try this out, you know. Boy, many a graduate student has found out, hey, they don't answer one-tenth the questions they think they're going to answer because we're still often raising more questions than we're answering because we know so little. And then fossil reefs are poorly identified. I just thought I'd put this in here because uh, you need to know that there's another. Fossil reefs are also mentioned that, hey, they take a lot of time to grow all these things, you know, you, you got a real problem with one. The identification of fossil reefs is highly questionable. Highly questionable. Poorly identified and could represent pseudo-reefs, pre-flood, in situ reefs, could have been some reefs before the flood, or transported reefs, and so on. Well, in conclusion, just let me leave you this, these thoughts here. There's good science and there's bad science. When it comes to the issue of origins, and you say, I'm not going to allow God in the picture. This is not logically acceptable. It's done all the time. Science has carved itself a closed box in which it will not allow God they say, well, you know, what I can see and so on, I'm going to believe. And there's no reality beyond that. There's no logical reason to say, hey, there's no reality beyond mechanistic factors. No, if you're open to search for truth, you're going to have to allow the possibility that there's a God. At present, science does not allow that. Science used to allow that when the laws of science were laid down. When men like Kepler and Galileo and uh, Newton and uh, uh, 
Pascal, Boyle, uh, these folks, they all included God in nature, and they were studying the laws that God had created. They considered God as the creator. Now science says, hey, don't include God. We, we, we just are going to deal with this simple thing. Uh, mechanistic, or you can say materialistic, or you can say naturalistic, those three words are somewhat similar. The approach there is too simple for reality, folks. It's a simplistic approach. And that's why people go off the bed and say, hey, try and find a problem here and so on and so forth. Uh, there is plenty of reason to believe in God. Nature and the Bible agree much more than is usually uh, surmised. I must tell you, as I've studied nature over the years, I'm becoming more and more convinced that there is a God, there is a designer, and if there is a designer, I think he'd communicate to us, and I think the Bible is his communication. May God bless you. Thank you for listening. Okay, any questions, or did you understand everything perfectly? Um, your chart of the lit literature there that mm -hmm. showed the rate of growth, uh, millimeters per year, whatever, it was soundings uh, that seemed to provide the quickest rate, mm -hmm. fastest rate. Right. How were those soundings conducted? You know, was that just lowering uh, different time? Well, I'm, I'm no specialist on soundings, but they, they have, uh, it's quite accurate because they, uh, they compensate, I mean, they, 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 they slow down they, they, uh, the um, level of the thing. They can tell pretty, pretty exactly where it is by uh, averaging. What they do is average the stuff, and they have just a mechanism that does that type of thing. So uh, that's the. Um, as I say I'm not a specialist in that, but I know that uh, they, they can get quite precise about exactly what's going on as far as the exact level of sea, sea water. It's, and it's, uh, it seems reliable. I mean, of course, they talk about sea level rise and so on. They, they have. Um, it's it's possible. That's all I can tell you. And accuracy is uh, experienced routinely, routinely. Yeah. The, the basalt, the base underneath the growth of the corals. Is there any estimates how old that is? The volcanic rocks. After all, it must be older than the coral reefs? Uh, of course, it'd have to be older than the coral reef, if it's a coral reef. Um, the, um, I don't know of any date on the, you must keep in mind, they, they didn't get very much out of this. Here you've got a 20 mile reef. You're, you, drill down with, uh, and uh, the beginnings at the, the, near the top, about, about a foot diameter, you know, when they got down lower down, the, the casings were down to seven inches and so on. And you, you, they did not pick up any basalt, I don't think, from the, the deepest one. They did find some basalt, uh, which was olivine basalt, from the, um, the main one that I showed you a picture of. Uh, but I don't think that has been dated, uh, per se. Uh, it'd be assumed to be older. Uh, the, um, the literature isn't as dogmatic as uh, the, the uh, I mean, the scientific literature is not as dogmatic as uh, what you might call the offensive literature. Uh, they suggest, well, maybe 
we had um, uh, this was so and so and maybe this that and they always say well no according to this person but uh, they leave it open for blaming on that person for what and it, it does suggest maybe well Eocene uh, most of the reef they consider to be Miocene and uh, then on top they'd say of course make it more recent uh, but that's, uh, that's very tentative it's based a little bit on uh, forams, but I mean, what do you do if a uh, 12-inch core in a 20-mile reef? Uh, you, <laughs> you need to be careful about what conclusions you draw, and you you, you get amazed at uh, how they uh, can suggest so many different things here when, when you have so few samples. Uh, the um, the reef at uh, F1, which is the one at the northeast, uh, uh, that one they uh, they got some good sample. The last third of it, or almost the last half of it, was just mostly uh, material especially on the outside of the reef. They found very little reef core stuff which is interesting. Mostly what they call lagoonal stuff, you know, uh, that's not so solid. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, they tried to date some of that stuff. Uh, they, they drill, they mostly use bits, it comes out. But uh, cores, there were very few cores, especially for E1, the one you I showed you a picture of. Uh, and so, uh, Schlanger, incidentally, who, who did the, the analysis uh, of the uh, reef interpretation, uh, happened to be my professor of physical geology at the University of California, Riverside. And uh, he, he was uh, quite interested in my work. In fact, I gave a lecture on, on our research there at the university on that, and uh, that along with uh, a uh, couple of creation uh, lectures I gave there, and uh, he uh, he's he's been, oh this is really speculative. What he says when he in his papers where he uh, reports on this, he says this is really speculative. The the thing isn't half as well known as you'd think when you read the literature. Uh, it's. Uh, and uh, some of the shocking things, you know, is uh, you don't find solid reef stuff all the way down that thing, not at all. The majority of it, there's very little solid reef stuff. The majority of it is talent, you know, lagoonal stuff or, or uh, reef slope outside, uh, not the hard core that's uh, supposed to be the wave resistant structure of the reef. Found it. They found very little of that, and so I just, uh, it's a it's a uh, uh, really a lot more work needs to be done. Awful lot more work needs to be done before you can really know what's going on there. Yeah, thank you. Um, is is all limestone uh, organic in origin, or is, is some of it? Precipitate, or um, I know we've had Steve Austin come and talk about the Dead Sea and oregonite, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's calcium carbonate. Um, is this stuff that isn't coral structure? Uh, could some of that be precipitate, or, or what is limestone? Well, you know, this is a debate issue, you know, and uh, uh, the geological literature tends to lean towards the idea. Well, no, limestone is produced by organisms, but you can't find the organisms is the problem. And they're, they're, they're uh, beginning to recognize this, and some questions are being raised recently in the literature about that. Uh, in Anna, we talk, the aragonite is considered the original coral stuff, and uh, Schlanger went through uh, 
some of this material and uh, analyzed it for aragonite, whether it's aragonite or calcite. And in certain, those areas where it had changed to calcite, he more or less felt, hey, this is where it was above sea level and the aragonite had been dissolved and reconverted to calcite, which is the normal pattern uh, that you get in this. And uh, he makes the reference, he says, no one knows what water does to, to this. Well, I, I have to totally disagree with him. I know what water does in all these sinkholes we have around the world. Uh, it dissolves uh, calcite very easily and aragonite and so on, dissolves it very easily. And uh, what he thinks is, you know, maybe uh, hundreds of feet above sea level that uh, this was at a time and so on, I, I think could have been those lenses of fresh water that uh, that's where they are. I mean, this is, you know, some these people, they get their water from these lenses on, on these islands. Uh, that's their source of fresh water when it's not raining. So, uh, I once took a group down St. Grand Canyon, you know, and I, I told them, I want you folks to estimate. Look at all the limestone, you know, go down through the Kaibab limestone and then other layers. And estimate to me how, what percentage of that you think is fossil. You know, and 1%, 5%, so on, so on. No, I, I, I think uh, there could have very well been some original limestone around here to uh, uh, provide the balance in the sea and so on, uh, originally created limestone, that's why it doesn't have any fossils in it. Uh, but there's not good solid evidence that this comes from uh, fossils and uh, uh, type of thing. So, but it's, you know, it's, some people say, oh, it's going to take a long time for all these organisms to produce all this limestone. So I, they haven't demonstrated that they, it came from organisms. In the uh, illustrated cross section of the atoll, yeah. on the right side there was something called, I think, Lithothamnion Ridge. Mm -hmm. What is that? It's uh, it's called it's produced by algae. It's uh, it's a ridge that you see out there. It's right at the wave breaker. Uh, on the outside. On the outside. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the classic divisions of the reef, per se. It's built up by, uh, it's kind of a reddish algae uh, that uh, precipitates the lime out of the seawater, and it forms this ridge there. It's just, you know, just a little higher spot. Uh, but it's one of the classic uh, divisions of a reef. Do all atolls have that? Uh, no, not, not all, no, no. Uh, but Anahuitalk has a very good one. By Algeria. Have you seen any Noah's flood type of evidence? I'm sorry? Any, have you seen any Noah's flood type of evidence? Man, there's all kinds of Noah's flood evidence. In the, in the reef? Oh, in the reef? No, per se, no. I, uh, I, I can't say that. I, I would say, you know, uh, I'm going to stay by this microphone here. The um, the fact that you have drowned reefs to me is fairly strong evidence that something happened much faster than your very slow geologic process because the reefs grow too fast and you know a slugger which is not the same slinger uh, but uh, they worked at the same time uh, slugger um, raised that question about hey how come we got these things here. Uh, because subsidence is so much slower than reef growth, and he used a one millimeter rate of reef growth, which is, uh, but um, I'll just, as an aside, uh, to me the strongest evidence for the flood in the geological record is uh, one, the extremely widespread deposits we have all over the place. Uh, these formations go on for miles and miles, and 
hundreds of miles and you keep driving and uh, two days later and you still have the same formation there. Uh, we have nothing like that going on on the surface of the Earth at present where uh, you have such a flat area of uniform deposit. There is absolutely, you know, take all your formations in the Grand Canyon and so on. There's no way you could lay those formations down at present on the present surface because our the surface is so carved. It is carved up and down like you can't believe. Uh, how are you going to lay a flat layer on that? You can't do it. But you look at those things, they're flat. Go look at the Grand Canyon. I mean, it's, just, it's incredibly flat. Those layers are incredibly flat. And what's more, uh, which I, I've talked here before about, is between some of those layers, you have parts of the geologic column missing. Or in the Grand Canyon, for instance, you have no Ordovician or Silurian in the Grand Canyon. That's 100 million years. Yet the top of the Cambrian, on which you have that gap, it's perfectly flat. How could you have no erosion for a hundred million years? Uh, I mean, you should have two miles of vertical erosion in a hundred million years. Of course, the average continental erosion. So. Uh, in reefs, no, but uh, in the rest of the GRI record, it's it's quite outstanding. I, uh, I, uh, I think there's no answer whatsoever to that. Uh, question of these widespread things except the worldwide flood. And it's, it's, not, it's not just the Grand Canyon, folks. This is over the whole world. We, we have these gaps all over the place. Well, whether it's New Zealand or Europe or South America, I've seen them there. And just one flat layer line on top of another, and parts of the GRI column missing, and they're just sitting there. No erosion for billions of years. Forget it. Yeah. I would think with all these flat layers, the reefs would have been ground down. Anything of existing for the reef? Well, um, and the, well, you, you're right. I mean, this is another point we can raise right off, and that is rates of erosion, folks. Rates of erosion are way, way too fast to fit with the standard geological column. Our uh, continents should have been eroded down to sea level at least a hundred times in geologic time. And, you know, and this, is in the, this is in the literature, folks. Uh, Dot and Baton, for instance, the book, I think it's called Geology of the Earth. Uh, uh, they, they say, well, man, uh, North America should be rooted down in 10 million years. What, 10 million years? I mean, you have continents that are two and three billion years old. How come it's still there? This is this is uh, uh, tells you uh, that there's got to be something wrong here with all this uh, radiometric dating. They say because it just doesn't fit the simple facts of erosion. I have a question about drowned reefs. Is the significance of the drowned reefs that that they would continue to grow and not have died? Um, is that why they're significant? Because they grow fast enough so they should keep on growing and they would not drown? Yes. Okay. My wife understands once in a while what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, now, there are other significant things, I mean, but th this is, uh, th they're, they're an enigma, you know, a lot of these things get drowned. But what they become significant, when you quantitatively evaluate them, uh, coral reefs grow way, way too fast. Uh, I was telling someone here, I can't remember who came talked to me about this, this argument of the drowned reefs, I used in the Arkansas trial. I don't know if you folks know about the Arkansas trial. That was uh, 1982, I think, 1981, 82, where um, Arkansas had passed a law. It's one of these major trials they've had. They passed a law and then it went 
uh, to court and so on, uh, and so they had this, this trial about it. And so I, you know, I, I was working on the coral reefs at the time. I thought, hey, uh, I'll, I'll use this drowned reef thing. That hey, uh, things have gone on faster in the past than than, than at present, you know. And uh, Roger Lewin of the Science Magazine, very famous uh, reporter for Science Magazine. Uh, he didn't even understand the argument. I mean, uh, the journalists, ordinary newspaper journalists, understood the argument, but <laughs> Roger Lewin he missed it. Uh, journal Science, you know, that's, that's an important journal, uh, probably the leading science journal in the world. Uh, so you know, I thought, well, I will write a little note to science and tell them, could you please uh, correct this interpretation, because this is what I was saying, type of thing. And a few weeks later, I got a little postcard that said, you know, we cannot include all comments from authors and so on. So uh, it never got corrected. Uh, they don't understand it, but some newspaper reporters do. So much for peer review. Uh, when it doesn't go their way, they need billions of years because that's, you know, the mutation rate that, for evolution. Uh, you know, we, and we know sea mounds rise and raise and lower depending on the, you know, the, the subduction mm -hmm. or the hot spots, whatever the effects are. Uh, what is the percentage of voids to the coral? What is what? What is the percentage? We have a lot of voids. You know, I'm sure sediment fills and then more coral build up on top. Uh, <clears throat> roughly, I'm just uh, I'm guessing from looking at the map, maybe about oh, maybe roughly a third of them are atolls, a third of them are sea mounts, and a third of them are these flat top gills. How did the flat? How did the gills get to be flat top? I think maybe they were all at a certain level in the latter parts of the flood or so on as the Pacific Ocean floor was spreading uh, and they got they got planed out at that level. That's just a wild suggestion uh, per se, but uh, you got over a hundred of these flat top geos there in the um, uh, western Pacific region type thing. You got seamounts there too. I'm just guessing roughly from the map. It's, it's roughly about that. Which would account for a mile of ice during an ice age on the continent, you know, a drop in sea level. Yeah, you, you know, you drop sea level was drop about 200 feet due to ice age type of thing. But these things are about 5,000 feet down. So I, I think I think it's more than that. What's yeah. the porosity? You say, you say coral to the voids. You say that's ten to one, or, or is it mostly coral? And and we talk not at all. I mean, you know, some just dealing with two pipes. I mean, <laughs> two little cores. You know, they didn't find any coral for seven hundred feet in one section. Uh, another time they went down, boy, the, the drill just went right through a big cavity. I don't remember what size, but it just dropped way down. There's a great big cavity and nothing in it. Uh, there, uh, a lot of the stuff was just loose rubble. Uh, on the other hand, they did find coral all the way down to the bottom. Uh, not all the way through, you understand? But at the bottom, but it was poor. Uh, could identify it as coral. Maybe sometimes the genes certainly they could not. Uh, it, it, preservation gets worse as you go down uh, towards the bottom. And, uh, so that, that's that's um, what's involved there, and. Uh, There's a there's a gap between those specialists who identify the coral and so on, and 
those who look at the rocks and uh, very few of them try to put together the, the picture and so you, you don't get a picture of a good image. Uh, Schlanger uh, did, did try and put that together and so on, but he was very cautious about uh, what's going on. Uh, he thinks uh, that the reef was more to the south east uh, in its earlier stages and it grew up towards the south northwest towards the northwest he thinks that type of thing but I don't think he has enough data to really uh, demonstrate that and he d I don't think he thinks so either but he's passed away now but in any way he, Okay, no more questions? I guess we... Thank you. Thank you.